Hello everyone, this is Pastor Dan with uh, the Athens Public Library wanting to read to you some more of the Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, as you maybe remember from the last time we got together, uh, we are reading The Horse and His Boy and we are on Chapter 9. We had just left Erebus and uh, Lasaraline uh, hiding in a room where the Tisrock was speaking about a plan to uh, take over Narnia. And, uh, and, uh, they, they, the Tisroch just left and they are terrified. Uh, but let's pick up and join them in their hiding place. How dreadful, how perfectly dreadful, whimpered Lasaraline. Oh, darling, I am so frightened. I'm shaking all over. Feel me. Come on, said Erebus, who was trembling herself. They've gone back to the new palace. Once we're out of this room, we're safe enough, but it's a wasted a terrible time. Get me down to that water gate as quick as you can. Darling, how can you? squeaked Lasarline. I can't do anything, not now. My poor nerves. No, we must just lie still a bit and then, and then go back. Why back? asked Erebus. Oh, you don't understand. You're so unsympathetic said Lasarline, beginning to cry. Erebus decided it was no occasion for mercy. Look here, she said, catching Lasarline and giving her a good shake. If you say another word about going back, and if you don't start taking me to the water gate at once, do you know what I'll do? I'll rush into that passage and scream! Then we'll both be caught. But we shall both be killed, said Lasarline. Didn't you hear what the Tisrock may he live forever said? Yes, and I'd sooner be killed than married to Ahoshta, so come on. Oh, you are unkind, said Lasarline, and I in such a state. But in the end, she had to give in to Erebus. She led the way down the steps they had already descended and along another corridor, and so finally out into the open air. They were now in the palace garden, which sloped down in terraces to the city wall. The moon shone brightly. One of the drawbacks about adventures is that when you come to the most beautiful places, you are often too anxious and hurried to appreciate them, so that Erebus, though she remembered them years later, had only a vague impression of grey lawns, quietly bubbling fountains, and the long black shadows of cypress trees. When they reached the very bottom and the wall rose frowning above them, Lasarline was shaking so much that she could not unbolt the gate. Erebus did it. There at last was the river, full of reflected moonlight and a little landing stage and a few pleasure boats. Goodbye, said Erebus, and thank you. I'm sorry if I've been a pig, but think... <coughs> Excuse me. But think what I'm fleeing from. Oh, Erebus, darling, said Lasarline, won't you change your mind, now that you've seen what a very great man a Hoshta is? Great man, said Erebus, a hideous groveling slave who flatters when he's kicked and treasures it all up and hopes to get his own back by egging on that horrible Tisrock to plot his son's death. Fah! I'd sooner marry my father's scullion than a creature like that. Oh, Erebus, Erebus, how can you say such dreadful things? And about the Tisrock, may he live forever, too. It must be right if he's going to do it. Goodbye, said Erebus, and I thought your dresses were lovely, and I think your house is lovely, too. I'm sure you'll have a lovely life, though it wouldn't suit me. Close the door softly behind me. She tore herself away from her friend's affectionate embraces, stepped into a punt, cast off, and a moment later was out in midstream with a huge real moon overhead and a huge reflected moon down, deep down in the river. The air was fresh and cool, and as she drew near the farther bank, she heard the hooting of an owl. Ah, that's better, thought Erebus. She had always lived in the country, and had hated every minute of her time in Tashban. 
When she stepped ashore, she found herself in darkness, for the rise of the ground and the trees cut off the moonlight. But she managed to find the same road that Shasta had found, and came just as he had done to the end of the grass and the beginning of the sand, and looked, like him, to her left, and saw the big black tombs. And now, at last, brave girl though she was, her heart quailed. Supposing the others weren't there, supposing the ghouls were. But she stuck out her chin, and a little bit of her tongue, too, and went straight towards them. But before she had reached them, she saw Bree and Wynne and the groom. You can go back to your mistress now, said Ervis, quite forgetting that he couldn't until the city gates opened the next morning. Here is money for your pains. To hear is a to obey, said the groom, and at once set off at a remarkable speed in the direction of the city. There was no need to tell him to make, a ha to make haste. He also had been thinking a good deal about ghouls. For the next few seconds, Erebus was busy kissing the noses and patting the necks of Huynh and Bree just as if they were ordinary horses. And here comes Shasta, thanks be to the lion, said Bree. Erebus looked round, and there, right enough, was Shasta, who had come out of hiding the moment he saw the groom going away. And now, said Erebus, there's not a moment to lose, and in hasty words she told them about Rabidash's expedition. Treacherous hounds, said Bree, shaking his mane and stamping with his hoof. An attack in time of peace, without defiance sent, but will grease his oats for him, will be there before he is. Can we? said Erebus, swinging herself into Wynne's saddle. Shasta wished he could mount like that. Boo! snorted Bree. Up you get, Shasta, can we? And with a good start, too? He said he was going to start at once, said Erebus. That's how humans talk, said Bree. But you can't get a company of two hundred horse and horsemen, watered and victualed and armed and saddled all and started all in a minute. Now, what's our direction? Due north? No, said Shasta, I know about that. I've drawn a line. I'll explain later. Bear a bit to our left, both you horses. Ah, there it is. Now, said Bree, all that about galloping for a day and a night like in stories can't really be done. It must be walk and trot, but brisk trots and short walks, and whenever we walk, you two humans can slip off and walk too. Now, are you ready, Huin? Off we go. Narnia in the north. At first it was delightful. The night had now been going on for so many hours that the sand had almost finished giving back all the sun heat it had received during the day, and the air was cool, fresh, and clear. Under the moonlight the sand in every direction and as far as they could see gleamed as if it were smooth water or a great silver tray. Except for the noise of breeze and wind's hoofs there was not a sound to be heard. Shasta would nearly have fallen asleep if he had not had to dismount and walk every now and then. This seemed to last for hours. Then there came a time when there was no longer any moon. They seemed to ride in the dead darkness for hours and hours. And after that there came a moment when Shasta noticed that he could see Bree's neck and head in front of him a little more clearly than before. And slowly, very slowly, he began to notice the vast gray flatness on every side. It looked absolutely dead, like something in a dead world. And Shasta felt quite terribly tired, and noticed that he was getting cold and that his lips were dry. And all the time the squeak of the leather, the jingle of the bits, and the noise of the hoofs, not property property as would be on a hard road, but thumbity thumbity on the dry sand. At last, after hours of riding, far away on his right there came a single long streak of paler gray low down on the horizon, then a streak of red. It was morning at last, but without a single bird to sing about it. He was glad of the walking bits now, for he was colder than ever. Then suddenly the sun rose and everything changed in a moment. The gray sand turned yellow and twinkled as if it were strewn with diamonds. On their left the shadows of Sa Shasta and Huynh and Bree and Aravis, enormously long, raced beside them. 
The double peak of Mount Pyre far ahead flashed in the sunlight, and Shasta saw they were a little out of the course. A bit left, a bit left, he sang out. Best of all, when you looked back, Tashban was already small and remote. The tombs were quite invisible, swallowed up in that single jagged-edged hump which was the city of the Tisrock. Everyone felt better. But not for long. Though Tashban looked very far away when they first saw it, it refused to look any further away as they went on. Shasta gave up looking back at it, for it only gave him the feeling that they were not moving at all. Then the light became a nuisance. The glare of the sand made his eyes ache, but he knew he mustn't shut them. He must screw them up and keep on looking ahead at Mount Pyre and shouting out directions. Then came the heat. He noticed it for the first time when he had to dismount and walk. He, as he slipped down to the sand, the heat from it struck up into his face as if from the opening of an oven door. Next time it was worse. But the third time, as his bare feet touched the sand, he screamed with pain and got one foot back in the stirrup and the other half over Bree's back before he could have said knife. Sorry, Bree, he gasped. I can't walk. It burns my feet. Of course, panted Bree. Should have thought of that myself. Stay on. Can't be helped. It's all right for you, said Shasta to Erevis, who was walking beside Wynne. You've got shoes on. Erevis said nothing and looked prim. Let's hope she didn't mean to, but she did. On again, trot and walk and trot. Jingle, jingle, jingle. Squeak, squeak, squeak. Smell of hot horse, smell of hot self, blinding glare, headache, and nothing at all different for mile after mile. Tashban would never look any further away. The mountains would never look any nearer. You felt this had been going on for always. Jingle, jingle, jingle. Squeak, squeak squeak smell of hot horse smell of hot self of course one tried all sorts of games with oneself to try to make the time pass and of course they were all no good and one tried very hard not to think of drinks iced sherbet in a place uh, in a palace in tashban clear spring water tinkling with a dark earthy sound cold smooth milk just creamy enough and not too creamy and the harder you tried not to think the more you thought at last there was something different a mass of rock sticking up out of the sand about fifty yards long and thirty feet high it did not cast much of a shadow, for the sun was now very high, but it cast a little into that shade they crowded. There they ate some food and drank a little water. It is not easy giving a horse a drink out of a skin bottle, but Bree and Wynn were clever with their lips. No one had anything like enough. No one spoke. The horses were flecked with foam, and their breathing was noisy. The children were pale. After a very short rest, they went on again. Same noises, same smells, same glare. Till at last their shadows began to fall on their right, and then got longer and longer till they seemed to stretch out to the eastern end of the world. Very slowly the sun drew nearer to the western horizon, and now at last he was down. And thank goodness the merciless glare was gone, though the heat coming up from the, the sand was still as bad as ever. Four pairs of eyes were looking out eagerly for any sign of the valley that Salopad the raven had spoken about, but mile after mile there was nothing but level sand. And now the day was quite definitely done and most of the stars were out, and the still the horses thundered on, and the children rose and sank in their saddles, miserable with thirst and weariness. Not till the moon had risen did Shasta, in the strange barking voice of someone whose mouth is perfectly dry, shout out, There it is! There was no mistaking it now. 
Ahead and a little to their right there was at last a slope, a slope downward and hummocks of rock on each side. The horses were far too tired to speak, but they swung toward, round towards it, and in a minute or two they were entering the gully. At first it was worse in there than it had been out in the open desert, for there was a breathless stuffiness between the rocky walls and less moonlight. The slope continued steeply downwards, and the rocks on either hand rose to the height of cliffs. Then they began to meet vegetation, prickly cactus-like plants and coarse grass of the kind that would prick your fingers. Soon the horse hooves were falling on pebbles and stones instead of sand. Round every bend of the valley, and it had many bends, they looked eagerly for water. The horses were nearly at the end of their strength now, and when stumbling and panting was lagging behind Bree, they were almost in despair before at last they came to a little muddiness and a tiny trickle of water through softer and better grass. And the trickle became a brook, and the brook became a stream with bushes on each side, and the stream became a river, and there came, after more disappointments than I could possibly describe, a moment when Shasta, who had been in a kind of doze, suddenly realized that Bree had stopped and found himself slipping off. Before them, a little cataract of water poured into a broad pool, and both the horses were already in the pool with their heads down, drinking, drinking, drinking. Oh, said Shasta, and plunged in. It was about up to his knees, and stooped his head right into the cataract. It was perhaps the loveliest moment in his life. It was about... Ten minutes later, when all four of them, the two children, wet nearly over, nearly all over, came out and began to notice their surroundings. The moon was now high enough to peep down into the valley. There was a soft grass on both sides of the river, and beyond the grass, trees and bushes sloped up to the bases of the cliffs. There must have been some wonderful flowering shrubs hidden in that shadowy undergrowth, for the whole glade was full of the coolest and most delicious smells. And out of the darkest recess among the trees there came a sh sound Shasta had never heard before, a nightingale. Everyone was much too tired to speak or to eat. The horses, without waiting to be unsaddled, lay down at once. So did Erebus and Shasta. About ten minutes later, the careful Wynne said, But we mustn't go to sleep. We've got to keep ahead of that rabbit ash. No, said Bree very slowly. Mustn't go to sleep. Just a little rest. Shasta knew for a moment that they would all go to sleep if he didn't get up and do something about it, and felt that he ought to. In fact, he decided that he would get up and persuade them to go on, but presently, not yet, not just yet. Very soon, the moon shone and the nightingale sang over two horses and two human children all fast asleep. It was Erebus who woke first. The sun was already high in the heavens and the cool morning hours were already wasted. It's my fault, she said to herself furiously as she jumped up and began rousing the others. One wouldn't expect horses to keep awake after a day's work like that, even if they can talk. And of course, that boy wouldn't. He's had no decent training. But I ought to have known better. The others were dazed and stupid with the heaviness of their sleep. I don't know. Boo -boo -boo, said Bree. Been sleeping in my saddle, eh? I'll never do that again. Most uncomfortable. Oh, come on, come on, come on, said Erebus. We've lost half the morning already. There isn't a moment to spare. A fellow's got to have a mouth full of grass, said Bree. I'm afraid we can't wait, said Erebus. What's the terrible hurry, said Bree. We've crossed the desert, haven't we? But we're not in Arkenland yet, said Erebus, and we've got to get there before Rabidash. Oh, we must be miles ahead of him, said Bree. Haven't we been coming a shorter way? Didn't that raven friend of yours say this was a shortcut, Shasta? But he didn't say anything about shorter, answered Shasta. 
He only said better because you got to a river this way. If the oasis is due north of Tashban, then I'm afraid this may be longer. Well, I can't go on without a snack, said Bree. Take my bridle off, Shasta. P please, said Wynne very shyly. I feel just like Bree that I can't go on. But when horses have humans with spurs and things on their backs, aren't they often made to go on when they're feeling like this? And then they find they can. I mean, oughtn't we to be able to do even more now that we're free? It's all for Narnia. I think, ma'am, said Bree very crushingly, that I know a little bit more about campaigns and forced marches and what a horse can stand than you do. To this, Quinn made no answer, being, like most highly bred mares, a very nervous and gentle person who was easily put down. In reality, she was quite right, and if Bree had a, had a Tarkin on his back at that moment to make him go on, he would have found that he was good for several hours hard going. But one of the worst results of being a slave and being forced to do things is that when there is no one to force you any more, you find you have almost lost the power of forcing yourself. So... They had to wait while Bree had a snack and a drink, and of course, Wynne and the children had a snack and a drink, too. It must have been nearly eleven o'clock in the morning before they finally got going again, and even then, Bree took things much more gently than yesterday. It was really Wynne, though she was the weaker and more tired of the two, who set the pace. The valley itself, with its brown, cool river and grass and moss and wild flowers and rhododendrons, was such a pleasant place that it made you want to ride slowly. And that is the end of chapter nine. Chapter ten. The Hermit of the Southern March. After they had ridden for several hours down the valley, it widened out and they could see what was ahead of them. The river which they had been following here joined a broader river, white wide and, excuse me, turbulent, which flowed from their left to their right towards the east. Beyond this new river, a delightful country rose gently in low hills, ridge beyond ridge, to the northern mountains themselves. To the right there were rocky pinnacles, one or two of them with snow clinging to the ledges. To the left, pine-clad slopes, frowning cliffs, narrow gorges, and blue peaks stretched away as far as the eye could reach. Shasta could no longer make out Mount Pyre. Straight ahead, of, uh, straight ahead, the mountain range sank to a wooded saddle, which of course had to be the pass from Arkenland into Narnia. Brrr! The north, the green north, neighed Bree and certainly the lower hills looked much greener and fresher than anything Erebus and Shasta with their southern-bred eyes had ever imagined. Spirits rose as they clattered down to the water's meat of the two rivers. The eastern-flowing river, which was pouring from the higher mountains at the western end of the range, was far too swift and too broken with rapids for them to think of swimming it, but after some casting about up and down the bank, they found a place shallow enough to wade. The roar and clatter of water, the great swirl against the horse's fetlocks, the cool, stirring air, and the darting dragonflies filled Shasta with a strange excitement. "'Friends, we are in Arkenland,' said Bree proudly as he splashed and churned his way out on the northern blank bank. I think that river we've cro just crossed is called the Winding Arrow. I hope we're in time, murmured Huynh. Then they began going up, slowly and zigzagging a good deal, for the hills were steep. It was all open park-like country, with no roads or houses in sight. Scattered trees, never thick enough to be a forest, were everywhere. Shasta, who had never had lived all his life in an almost treeless grassland, had never seen so many or so many kinds. If you had been there, you would probably have known, he didn't, that he was seeing oaks, beeches, silver birches, rowans, and sweet chestnuts. Rabbits scurried away in every direction as they advanced, and presently they saw a whole herd of fallow deer making off among the trees. "'Isn't it simply glorious?' 
said Erebus. At the first ridge, Shasta turned in the saddle and looked back. There was no sign of Tashban. The desert, unbroken except by the narrow green crack down which they had traveled, spread to the horizon. Hello, he said suddenly. What's that? What's what? said Bree, turning around. When and Erebus did the same. That, said Shasta, pointing. It looks like smoke. Is it a fire? Sta sandstorm, I should say, said Bree. Not much wind to raise it, said Erebus. Oh, exclaimed Wynne, look, there are things flashing in it. Look, there are helmets and armor, and it's moving, moving this way. By Tash, said Erebus, it's the army, it's Rabidash. Of course it is, said Wynne, just what I was afraid of. Quick, we must get to Anvar before it. And without, without another word, she whisked round and began galloping north. Bree tossed his head and did the same. "'Come on, Bree, come on!' yelled Erebus over her shoulder. The race was very grueling for the horses. As they topped each ridge, they found another valley and another ridge beyond it, and though they knew they were going in more or less the right direction, no one knew how far it was to Anvard. From the top of the second ridge, Shasta looked back again. Instead of dust cloud well out in the desert, he now saw a black moving mass rather like ants on the far bank of the winding arrow. They were doubtless looking for a ford. They're on the river, he yelled wildly. Quick, quick, shouted Erebus. We might as well not have come at all if we don't reach Anvard in time. Gallop, Bree, gallop. Remember, you're a war horse. It was all Shasta could do to prevent himself from shouting out similar instructions, but he thought, the poor chap's doing all he can already, and held his tongue. And certainly, both horses were doing, if not all they could, all they thought they could, which is not quite the same thing. Bree had caught up with Hwin, and they thundered side by side over the turf. It didn't look as if Hwin could possibly keep it up much longer. At that moment, everyone's feelings were completely altered by a sound from behind. It was not the sound they had been expecting to hear, the noise, noise of hooves and jingling armor mixed, perhaps, with Calamine battle cries. Yet Shasta knew it at once. It was the same snarling roar he had heard that moonlit night when they first met Erebus and Hwyn. Bree knew it, too. His eyes gleamed red, and his ears lay flat back on his skull, and Bree now discovered that he had not really been going as fast, not quite as fast, as he could. Shasta felt the change at once. Now they were really going all out. In a few seconds, they were well ahead of Wynne. It's not fair, thought Shasta. I did think we'd be safe from lions here. He looked over his shoulder. Everything was only too clear. A huge, tawny creature, its body low to the ground like a cat streaking across the lawn to a tree when a strange dog has got into the garden, was behind them, and it was nearer every second and half-second. He looked forward again and saw something which he did not take in or even think about. Their way was barred by a smooth green wall about ten feet high. In the middle of that wall there was a gate, open. In the middle of the gateway stood a tall man dressed down to his bare feet in a robe colored like autumn leaves, leaning on a straight staff. His beard fell almost to his knees. Shasta saw all this in a glance and looked back again. The lion had almost got wind now. It was making snaps at her hind legs, and there was no hope now in her foam-flecked, wide-eyed face. Stop! bellowed Shasta in Bree's ear. Must go back! Must help! Bree always said afterwards that he never heard or never understood this, and as he was in general a very truthful horse, we must accept his word. Shasta slipped his feet out of the stirrups, slid both his legs over the left side, hesitated for one hideous hundredth of a second, and jumped. It hurt horribly and nearly winded him, but before he knew how it hurt him, he was staggering back to help Erebus. 
He had never done anything like this in his life before and hardly knew why he was doing it now. One of the most terrible noises in the world, a horse's scream broke from Wynne's lips. Erebus was stooping low over Wynne's neck and seemed to be trying to draw her sword, and now all three, Erebus, Wynne, and the lion, were almost on top of Shasta. Before they reached him, the lion rose on its hind legs larger than you would have believed a lion could be, and jabbed at Erebus with its right paw. Shasta could see all the terrible claws extended. Erebus screamed and reeled in the saddle. The lion was tearing her shoulders. Shasta, half mad with horror, managed to lurch towards the brute. He had no weapon, not even a stick or a stone. He shouted out idiotically at the lion as one would at a dog, Go home! Go home! For a fraction of a second, he was staring right into its wide-opened, raging mouth. Then, to his utter astonishment, the lion, still on its hind legs, checked itself suddenly, turned head over heels, picked itself up, and rushed away. Shasta did not for a moment suppose it had gone for good. He turned and raced for the gate in the green wall, which, now for the first time, he remembered seeing. Wynne, stumbling and nearly fainting, was just entering the gate. Aravis still kept her seat, but her back was covered with blood. "'Come in, my daughter, come in,' the robed and bearded man was saying, and then, "'Come in, my son,' as Shasta panted up to him. He heard the gate closed behind him, and the bearded stranger was already helping Aravis off her horse. They were in a wide and perfectly circular enclosure protected by a high wall of green turf, a pool of perfectly still water so full that the water was almost exactly level with the ground, lay before him. At one end of the pool, completely overshadowing it with its branches, there grew the hugest and most beautiful tree that Shasta had ever seen. Beyond the pool was a little low house of stone, roofed with deep and ancient thatch. There was a sound of bleating, and over at the far side of the enclosure there were some goats. The level ground was completely covered with the finest grass. Are, are, are he, you, panted Shasta, are you King Loon of Arkenland? The old man shook his head. No he replied in a quiet voice. I am the hermit of the Southern March. And now, my son, waste no time on questions, but obey. This damsel is wounded. Your horses are spent. Rabidash is at this moment finding a ford over the winding arrow. If you run now, without a moment's rest, you will still be in time to warn King Loon." Shasta's heart fainted at these words, for he felt that he had no strength left, and he writhed inside at what seemed the cruelty and unfairness of the demand. He had not yet learned that if you do one good deed, your reward usually is to be set another a harder and better one. But all he said out loud was, Where's the king? The hermit turned and pointed with his staff. Look he said. There is another gate, right opposite to the one you entered by. Open it, and go straight ahead. Always straight ahead. Over level or steep, over smooth or rough, over dry or wet. I know by my art that you will find King Loon straight ahead. But run, run. Always run. Shasta nodded his head, ran to the northern gate, and disappeared beyond it. Then the hermit, took Erebus, whom he had all this time been supporting with his left arm, and half led, half carried her into the house. After a long time he came out again. Now, cousins, he said to the horses, it is your turn. Without waiting for an answer, and indeed they were too exhausted to speak, he took the bridles and saddles off both of them. Then he rubbed them both down so well that a groom in a king's stable could not have done it better. There, cousins, he said, dismiss it all from your minds and be comforted. Here is water and there is grass. 
You shall have a hot mash when I have milked my other cousins, the goats. Sir, said Huynh, finding her voice at last, will the Tarkina live? Has the lion killed her? I, who know many present things by my art, replied the hermit with a smile, have yet little knowledge of things future. Therefore I do not know whether any man or woman or beast in the whole world will be alive when the sun sets tonight. But, be of good hope, the damsel is likely to live as long as any of her age. When Erebus came to herself, she found that she was lying on her face on a low bed of extraordinary softness in a cool, bare room with walls of un undressed stone. She couldn't understand why she had been laid on her face, but when she turned, tried to turn and felt the hot, burning pains all over her back, she remembered and realized why. She couldn't understand what delightfully springy stuff the bed was made of, because it was made of heather, which is the best bedding, and heather was a thing she had never seen or heard of. The door opened, and the hermit entered, carrying a large wooden bowl in his hand. After carefully setting this down, he came to the bedside and asked, "'How do you find yourself, my daughter?' "'My back is very sore, father,' said Erebus. "'But there is nothing else wrong with me.' He knelt beside her, laid his hand on her forehead, and felt her pulse. "'There is no fever,' he said. "'You will do well. Indeed, there is no reason why you should not get up tomorrow. But now, drink this.' He fetched the wooden bowl and held it to her lips. Erebus couldn't help making a face when she tasted it, for goat's milk is rather a shock when you are not used to it. But she was very thirsty and managed to drink it all and felt better when she had finished. Now, my daughter, you may sleep when you wish, said the, he said the hermit, for your wounds are washed and dressed, and though they smart, they are no more serious than if they had been the cuts of a whip. It must have been a very strange lion, for instead of catching you out of the saddle and getting his teeth into you, he has only drawn his claws across your back. Ten scratches, sore, but not deep or dangerous. I say, said Erebus, I have had luck. Daughter, said the hermit, I have now lived a hundred and nine winters in this world and have never yet met any such thing as luck. There is something about all this that I do not understand. But if we ever need to know it, you may be sure that we shall. And what about Rabidash and his two hundred horse? asked Erebus. They will not pass this way, I think, said the hermit. They must have found a ford by now well to the east of us. From there they will try to ride straight to Anvard. Poor Shasta, said Erebus. Has he far to go? Will he get there first? There is good hope of it, said the old man. Erebus lay down again on her side this time, and said, Have I been asleep for a long time? It seems to be getting dark. The hermit was looking out of the only window, which faced north. This is not the darkness of night, he said presently. The clouds are falling down from Stornis Head. Our foul weather always comes from there in these parts. There will be thick fog tonight. Next day, except for her sore back, Erebus felt so well that after breakfast, which was porridge and cream, the hermit said she could get up, and, of course, she went at once to speak to the horses. The weather had changed, and the whole of that green enclosure was filled like a great green cup with sunlight. It was a very peaceful place, lonely and quiet. Wynne at once trotted across to Erebus and gave her a horse kiss. But where is Bree? said Erebus, when each had asked after the other's health and sleep. Over there, said Wynne, pointing with her nose at, to the far side of the circle. And I wish you'd come talk to him. There's something wrong. I can't get a word out of him. They strolled across and found Bree lying with his face towards the wall, and though he must have heard them coming, he never turned his head or spoke a word. Good morning, Bree, said Erebus. How are you this morning? Bree muttered something that no one could hear. The hermit says that Shasta probably got to King Loon in time, continued Erebus, so it looks as if all our troubles are over. Narnia at last, Bree. I shall never see you, Narnia, said Bree in a low voice. 
Aren't you well, Bree, dear? Bree turned round at last, his face mournful as only a horse's can be. I shall go back to Callerman, he said. What? said Eros. Back to slavery? Yes, said Bree. Slavery is all I'm fit for. How could I ever show my face among the free horses of Narnia? I who left a mare and a girl and a boy to be eaten by lions, while I galloped all I could to save my own wretched skin. We all ran as hard as we could, said Wynn. Shasta didn't, snorted Bree. At least he ran in the right direction, ran back, and that is what shames me most of all. I, who called myself a war horse and boasted of a hundred fights to be beaten by a little human boy, a child, a mere foal, who had never held a sword nor had any good nurture or example in his life. I know, said Erebus. I felt just the same. Shasta was marvelous. I'm just as bad as you, Bree. I've been snubbing him and looking down on him ever since you met us, and now he turns out to be the best of us all. But I think it would be better to stay and say we're sorry than to go back to Callerman. It's all very well for you, said Bree. You haven't disgraced yourself, but I've lost everything. My good horse, said the hermit, who had approached them unnoticed because his bare feet made so little noise on that sweet dewy grass. My good horse, you've lost nothing but your self-conceit. No, no, cousin, don't put back your ears and shake your mane at me. If you are really so humbled as you sounded a minute ago, you must learn to listen to sense. You're not quite the great horse you had come to think from living among poor dumb horses. Of course, you were braver and cleverer than them. You could hardly help being that. It doesn't follow that you'll be anyone very special in Narnia. But as long as you know you're nobody special, you'll be a very decent sort of horse, on the whole, and taking one thing with another. And now, if you and my other four-footed cousin will come round to the kitchen door, we'll see about the other half of that mash. And that is the end of the chapter. Chapter 11. The Unwelcome Fellow Traveler. When Shasta went through the gate, he found a slope of grass and a little heather running up before him to some trees. He had nothing to think about now, and no plans to make. He had only to run, and that was quite enough. His limbs were shaking, a terrible stitch was beginning in his side, and the sweat that kept dropping into his eyes blinded them and made them smart. He was unsteady on his feet, too, and more than once he nearly turned his ankle on a loose stone. The trees were thicker now than they had yet been, and in the more open spaces there was bracken. The sun had gone in without making it any cooler. It had become one of those hot, gray days when there seemed to be twice as many flies as usual. Shasta's face was covered with them. He didn't even try to shake them off. He had too much else to do. Suddenly he heard a horn, not a great throbbing horn like the horns of Tashban, but a merry call. Tyru to to hoo Next moment he came out into a wide glade and found himself in a crowd of people. At least it looked a crowd to him. In reality there were about fifteen or twenty of them, all gentlemen in green hunting dress, with their horses, some in the saddle and some standing by their horses' heads. In the center, someone was holding the stirrup for a man to mount, and the man he was holding it for was the jolliest, fattest, most apple-cheeked, twinkling-eyed king you could imagine. As soon as Shasta came in sight, this king forgot all about mounting his horse. He spread out his arms to Shasta, his face lit up, and he cried out in a great deep voice that seemed to come from the bottom of his chest, Corin, my son, on, on foot and in rags, what? No, panted Shasta, shaking his head. Not Prince Corin. I, I, I know I'm like him. Saw his highness in Tashban. Sent his greetings. The king was staring at Shasta with an extraordinary expression on his face. Are you King Loon? gasped Shasta. And then, without waiting an answer, Lord King Fly, 
Envar, shut the gates, enemies upon you, Rabidash and two hundred horse. Have you assurance of this boy? asked one of the other gentlemen. My own eyes, said Shasta. I've seen them, raced them all the way from Tashbed. On foot, said the gentleman, rising his eyebrow, raising his eyebrows a little. Horses with the hermit, said Shasta. Question him no more, Darren, said King Loon. I see truth in his face. We must ride for it, gentlemen. A spare horse there for the boy. You can ride fast, friend. For answer, Shasta put his foot in the stirrup of the horse, which had been led toward him, and a moment later he was in the saddle. He had done it a hundred times with Bree in the last few weeks, and his mounting was very different now from what it had been on the first night when Bree had said that he climbed up a horse as if he were climbing a haystack. He was pleased to hear the Lord Darren saying to the king, The boy has a true horseman's seat, sire. I'll warrant that there's noble blood in him. His blood, aye, that's the point, said the king and he stared hard at Shasta again with that curious expression, almost a hungry expression, in his steady gray eyes. But by now the whole party was moving off at a brisk canter. Shasta's seat was excellent, but he was sadly puzzled as to what to do with the reins, for he had never touched the reins while he was on Bree's back. But he looked very carefully out of the corners of his eyes to see what the others were doing, as some of us have done at parties when we weren't quite sure which knife or fork we were meant to use, and tried to get his fingers right, but he didn't dare to try really directing the horse. He trusted it would follow the rest. The horse was, of course, an ordinary horse, not a talking horse, but it had quite wits enough to realize that the strange boy on its back had no whip and no spurs and was not really master of the situation. That was why Shasta found himself at the tail end of the procession. Even so, he was going pretty fast. There were no flies now, and the air in his face was delicious. He had got his breath back, too, and his errand had succeeded. For the first time since the arrival at Tashban, how long ago it seemed, he was beginning to enjoy himself. He looked up to see how much nearer the mountain tops had come. To his disappointment, he could not see them at all, only vague grayness rolling down towards them. He had never been in mountain country before, and was surprised. It's a cloud, he said to himself. Cloud coming down. I see. Up here in the hills, one really is in the sky. I shall see what the inside of a cloud is like. What fun. I've often wondered. Far away on his left, and a little behind him, the sun was getting ready to set. They had come to a rough kind of road by now, and were making very good speed. But Shasta's horse was still the last of the lot. Once or twice, when the road made a bend, there were now continuous forests on each side of it, he lost sight of the others for a second or two. Then they plunged into the fog, or else the fog rolled over them. The world became grey. Shasta had not realized how cold and wet the inside of a cloud would be, nor how dark. The grey turned to black with alarming speed. Someone at the head of the column winded the horn every now and then, and each time the sound came from a little farther off. He couldn't see any of the others now, but of course he'd be able to as soon as he got round the next bend. But when he rounded it, he still couldn't see them. In fact, he could see nothing at all. His horse was walking now. Get on, horse, get on! Then said Shasta, then came the horn, very faint. Bree had always told him that he must keep his heels well turned out, and Shasta had got the idea that something very terrible would happen if he dug his heels into a horse's side. This seemed to him an occasion for trying it. Look here, horse, he said. If you don't buck up, do you know what I'll do? I'll dig my heels into you. I really will. The horse have took no notice, however, of this threat. So Shasta settled himself firmly into the saddle, gripped with his knees, clenched his teeth, and punched both the horse's sides with his heels as hard as he could. The only result was that the horse broke into a kind of pretense of a trot for five or six paces, and then subsided into a walk again. And now it was quite dark, and they seemed to have given up blowing that horn. 
The only sound was a steady drip, drip from the branches of the trees. Well, I suppose even a walk will get us somewhere sometime, said Shasta to himself. I only hope I shan't run into Rabidash and his people. He went on for what seemed a long time, always at a walking pace. He began to hate that horse, and he was also beginning to feel very hungry. Presently, he came to a place where the road divided into two. He was just wondering which led to Anvard when he was startled by a noise from behind him. It was the noise of trotting horses. Rabidash, thought Shasta. He had no way of guessing which road Rabidash would take. But if I take one, said Shasta to himself, he may take the other, and if I stay at the crossroads, I'm sure to be caught. He dismounted and led his horse as quickly as he could along the right-hand road. The sound of the cavalry grew rapidly nearer, and in a minute or two Shasta realized that they were at the crossroads. He held his breath, waiting to see which way they would take. Then came a low word of command. Halt! Then a moment of horsey noises, nostrils blowing, horses' hooves pawing, bits being champed, necks being patted. Then a voice spoke. Attend, all of you, it said. We are now within a furlong of the castle. Remember your orders. Once we are in Narnia, as we should be by sunrise, you are to kill as little as possible. On this venture, you are to regard every drop of Narnian blood as more precious than a gallon of your own. On this venture, I say, the gods will send us a happier hour, and then you must leave nothing alive between Caraparavel and the western waste. But we are not yet in Narnia. Here in Arkenland it is another thing. In the assault on the castle, this castle of King Loon's, nothing matters but speed. Show your mettle. It must be mine within an hour, and if it is, I give it all to you. I reserve, reserve no booty for myself. Kill me every barbarian male within its walls, down to the child that was born yesterday, and everything else is yours to divide as you please. The women, the gold, the jewels, the weapons, and the wine. The man that I see hanging back when we come to the gates shall be burned alive. In the name of Tash, the irresistible, the inexorable, forward! With a great cloppity-clop, the column began to move, and Shasta breathed again. They had taken the other road. Shasta thought they took a long time going past, for though he had been talking and thinking about two hundred horse all day, he had not realized how many they really were. But at last the sound died away, and once more he was alone amid the drip-drip from the trees. He now knew the way to Anvard, but of course he could not now go there. That would only mean running into the arms of Rabidash's troopers. What on earth, what on earth am I to do? said Shasta to himself. But he remounted his horse and continued along the road he had chosen, in the faint hope of finding some cottage where he might ask for shelter and a meal. He had thought, of course, of going back to Erevis and Bree and Hwyn at the Hermitage, but he couldn't, because by now he had not the least idea of the direction. After all, said Shasta, this road is bound to get to somewhere. But that all depends on what you mean by somewhere. The road kept on getting to somewhere in the sense that it got to more and more trees, all dark and dripping, and to colder and colder air. And strange, icy winds kept blowing the mist past him, though it never blew it away. If he had been used to mountain country, he would have realized that this meant he was now very high up, perhaps right at the top of the pass. But Shasta knew nothing about mountains. I do think, said Shasta, that I must be the most unfortunate boy that ever lived in the whole world. <coughs> everyone, Everything goes right for everyone except me. Those Narnian lords and ladies got safe away from Tashman. I was left behind. Erevis and Bree and Wynne are all as snug as anything with that old hermit. Of course, I was the one who was sent on. King Loon and his people must have got safely into the castle and shut the gates long before Rabidash arrived, but I got left out. And being very tired and having nothing inside him, he felt so sorry for himself that the tears rolled down his cheeks. What, it put, what put a stop to all this was a sudden fright. Shasta discovered that someone or some body was walking beside him. 
It was pitch dark, and he could see nothing, and the thing, or person, was going so quietly that he could hardly hear any football falls. What he could hear was breathing. His invisible companion seemed to breathe on a very large scale. Shasta got the impression that it was a very large creature, and he had come to notice this breathing so gradually that he really had no idea how long it had been there. It was a horrible shock. It darted into his mind that he had heard long ago that there were giants in these northern countries. He bit his lip in terror. But now that he really had something to cry about, he stopped crying. The thing, unless it was a person, went on beside him so very quietly that Shasta began to hope he had only imagined it. But just as he was becoming quite sure of it, there suddenly came a deep, rich sigh out of the darkness behind, beside him. That couldn't be his imagination. Anyway, he had felt the hot breath of that sigh on his chilly left hand. If the horse had been any good, or if he had known how to get any good out of the horse, he would have risked everything on a breakaway and a wild gallop. But he knew he couldn't make that horse gallop, so he went on at a walking pace, and the unseen companion walked and breathed beside him. At last, he could bear it no longer. Who are you? he said, scarcely above a whisper. One who has waited long for you to speak, said the thing. Its voice was not loud, but very large and deep. Are you, are you a giant? asked Shasta. You might call me a giant, said the large voice, but I'm not like the creatures you call giants. I can't see you at all, said Shasta, after staring very hard. Then for, an even, then, for an even more terrible idea had come into his head, he said, almost in a scream, You're not, not something dead, are you? Oh, please, please do go away. What harm have I ever done to you? Oh, I am the unluckiest person in the whole world. Once more, he felt the warm breath of the thing on his hand and face. There, it said, that is not the breath of a ghost. Tell me your sorrows. Shasta was a little reassured by the breath, so he told how he had never known his real father or mother, and had been brought up sternly by the fishermen. And then he told the story of his escape, and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives, and for all their dangers in Tashban, and about how about his night among the tombs, and how the beasts howled at him out of the desert, and he told about the heat and thirst of their desert journey, and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded Erebus, and also how very long it was since he had had anything to eat. I do not call you unfortunate, said the large voice. Don't you think it was bad luck to meet so many lions? There was only one lion, said the voice. What on earth do you mean? I've just told you there were at least two the first night, and there was only one, but he was swift of foot. How do you know? I was the lion. And as Shasta gasped with open mouth and said nothing, the voice continued, I was the lion who forced you to join with Erevis. I was the cat who comforted you among the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion you do not remember who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it came to shore where a man sat, wakeful at midnight, to receive you. Then it was you who wounded Erebus? It was I. But what for? Child, said the voice, I am telling you your story, not hers. I tell no one any story but his own. Who are you? asked Shasta. Myself, said the voice very deep and low, so that the earth shook. Myself, loud and clear and gay, and then the third time, myself, 
whispered so softly you could hardly hear it, and yet it seemed to come from all round you as if the leaves rustled with it. Shasta was no longer afraid that the voice belonged to something that would eat him, nor that it was the voice of ghost, but a new and different sort of trembling came over him. Yet he felt glad, too. The mist was turning from black to gray and from gray to white. This must have been begun, happen, begun to happen some time ago, but while he had been talking to the, uh, the thing, he had not been noticing anything else. Now the whiteness around him became a shining whiteness. His eyes began to blink. Somewhere ahead he could hear birds singing. He knew the night was over at last. He could see the mane and ears and head of his horse quite easily now. A golden light fell on them from the left. He thought it was the sun. He turned and saw, pacing beside him, taller than the horse, a lion. The horse did not seem to be afraid of it, or else could not see it. It was from the lion that the light came. No one ever saw anything more terrible or beautiful. Luckily, Shasta had lived all his life too far south in Calorman to have heard the tales that were whispered in Tashban about a dreadful Narnian demon that appeared in the form of a lion. And, of course, he knew none of the true stories about Aslan, the great lion, the son of the emperor beyond the sea, the high king above all kings in Narnia. But after one glance at the lion's face, he slipped out of the saddle and fell at its feet. He couldn't say anything, but then he didn't want to say anything, and he knew he needn't say anything. The high king above all kings stooped towards him, its mane and some strange and solemn perfume that hung about the mane was all around him. It touched his forehead with its tongue. He lifted his face, and their eyes met. Then instantly the pale brightness of the mist and the fiery brightness of the lion rolled themselves together into a swirling glory and gathered themselves up and disappeared. He was alone with the horse on a grassy hillside under a blue sky, and there were birds singing. And that is the end of chapter 11. Come back tomorrow. Talk to you later. Bye.